So awesome to be here with you all. I'm Dana from Solana Foundation in University Relations. So obviously onboarding new users is very important to me. And I am super excited to be joined by these gigabrains and OGs today. Andrew from Republic Crypto, Prakash from Chingari, Sinlin from Web3 Auth, and Trevor from Stepin. And we're gonna jam about what it would look like to onboard a billion new users and if we can even do it. So I wanted to start by asking you guys to kind of introduce yourselves through your own red pill experience. Who onboarded you and what did that look like? Anybody want to take it first? Yeah, so hi, nice to see you all here today. I'm Trevor, I work as head of business development for Stepin. And the first time I got involved with crypto was uh, I bought a one Bitcoin back in 2014. Fortunately, I didn't hold it too long. <laughs> um, and then I was kind of in and out through some of like the, the bull and bear cycles since then. Hi, my name is Sin Lin. The first time I got into Web3 was when my friend introduced me about the existence of extension, which as a mainstream user, I would not know that existed. That's where I got my first wallet and never looked back then. <laughs> Um, I'm Prakash, uh, so my Red Pill kind of goes a very mixed way, so uh, until 2015 I was like a medical doctor, so, but I wanted to double down on tech, like you wanted to be one to one, one to me, many than one to one. So it wasn't until 2019 that I could actually build products out of crypto, so that's when my initial Red Pill moment started. And uh, later on in later 2020s, I think uh, I found the non-EVMs a bit more uh, really challenging to explore now. R&D, and yeah, I think that's when my double learning on Solana architecture kind of began and before joining Shingari. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Durgi, I'm head of Republic Crypto. Uh, I have a little different version, I think, than everyone else. I uh, was red pulled by an engineering buddy of mine uh, who read Satoshi's white paper in 2009, December 2009. Uh, he found it in an anti-government libertarian IRC chat, and uh, by early February in 2010, we had a pretty aggressive mining operation running. Uh, so we were off to the races at that point. That's wild. I, I mean, I discovered, we, we talked a bit backstage, obviously, and I found this out. One of the questions I was going to ask you all, and I am going to ask you, but is, a, is there one resource that you wish you had found earlier that would have changed the game in terms of your onboarding experience? And Andrew answered that with me. He's like, well, I started with the white paper. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but if anybody else wants to jump in on something that has, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Actually, I, I was thinking of uh, one resource that's been incredible and what has brought everybody here, meeting everybody um, at crypto conferences and networking events. So I was gonna say one resource was probably networking events and like seeing and meeting people who are actually working in the industry. Like when I just like traded one Bitcoin and then I kind of got involved or some tokens was really abstract and like, uh, you know, I didn't know like who was behind the scenes, like why are people building in this, in this industry and what's going on. So when I started really going to Solana Hacker Houses um, earlier this year, I was like, wow, there's some really incredible people building in, you know, in crypto and, and the industry as a whole. Yep, so for me, I think it's more about also the community. That's why many DAOs exist and people like reach out to the younger crowd from the university to, to onboard them. I think exposure and the community really helps to, to bring people on. Yeah. And I think adding to Andrew's answer, I think it's hard to be more OG than that. But yeah, apart from that, I think for me, I would like to have seen more crypto conferences and hacker houses oriented. I think that's something Solana has done really well. So yeah, I think that kind of resource where you can learn from a very basic point of view, that's how you can encourage more builders to come to the scene as well. Yeah. So let's get into something like a little deeper, a billion users. How are we going to do it? What's the app that's going to push it over? What is it? And if it happens, can we actually handle it? Yeah, I can jump into that first. I mean, the reality is no one can handle a, b a billion users. Um, you can take all the existing blockchains across the board, uh, and they wouldn't be able to handle a billion users of transaction. Um, but I mean, I think the goal is about looking forward. Uh, and we, at least on the Republic crypto side, we continually look at infrastructure. You know, there's plenty of, of app products that are coming out that are proof of concept, that are kind of pushing the envelope forward. But if the infrastructure is not there from uh, a custodial standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from you know, a technology standpoint, 
it, it won't really, really matter. And I think that's really the opportunity in this room is, is, is you know, who can continue to build the infrastructure that allows this thing to actually get to where it can handle a billion, you know, a billion users. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Um, uh, we were talking about this a little bit. Is even when, you know, stepping at, you know, when I started at, uh, you know, just playing like 30,000 daily active users was just far. The experience was incredibly different as soon as they started to ramp up to you know, uh, reaching like the peak of like 1 million daily active users. And I mean, like everything broke in the app, like <laughs> on, on the back end, I mean, uh, on the front end, there were web two infrastructure problems, right? Of, uh, y you know, um, scaling up like your AWS service or, or handling throughput for just, you know, uh, all, all the runs. But there are also major web three infrastructure demands that we were not ready for, right? Like handling all of the, um, you know, token swaps from, from our, uh, our custodial wallet to the non-custodial wallet, and it would have delays. People would be submitting thousands of customer service tickets a day. It was, it was madness. Yeah, I mean, Ch Chikari's got 30, ma 30 million plus, you know, active users at this point, right? So, you know, they're one of the larger, especially on the Solana ecosystem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can even talk about yeah. how difficult it is to manage that. Of course, yeah. yeah. I think to add on to that, so when I joined, we had around 200K active on-chain users. So right now, it's close to like 1.5 million wallets activated. So there's at least like there's at least at one point of time they're onboarded with an on-chain element. I think that's the biggest success story. If we, are, we can say that. But uh, I think the answer to the previous question is also that uh, I think we need to also think about the ideal way to onboarding is having like a Web2 front end and a crypto backend. So the users should not even be bothered about what blockchain they're on. And I think that's the key to kind of making very frictionless as much as possible. Yeah, that makes me think, like, what's the difference between onboarding Web 2 and Web 3? How, what's, what's the difference? I guess, Sinlin, you're like really in the design kind of, of some of these things. So you want to jump in on that? Yep, so based on what the three gentlemen mentioned just now, it brings, it's a good summary of, like, we often think that users are not ready for Web3, but actually Web3 might not be ready for users based on infrastructure or design. And the differences between onboarding Web2 users and Web3 users is Web3 users, they're all about like simplicity, everything within one click. Um, Web3 users, they're more privacy, data, security focused. Then you got to ensure that, hey, this is secure. You got to give them the trust. So it's all about simplicity, simplicity for Web2 and then trust for Web3 users. Awesome. So how much do we actually know about the users that we're onboarding? And how much do we want to know? And I have another, well, what do we want them to do once they're onboarded? <laughs> like, exactly, because everyone talks about onboarding the next billion users, but exactly who are these billion users? Are they the existing ones? They're on, for example, the, the platforms that they are already using? Or are they the underserved, the unbanked, that could benefit from Web3? Um, this is a question that founders or app developers have to find out and match and better meet the, the goals of their users to scale. Yeah, I think GameFi is probably an area where you're going to see it the most. It's like one of, one of the more like retail, easily uh, you know, translatable pieces. Um, and we're probably most likely in, in Asia, almost certainly. Yeah. I was at Korea blockchain this, this past year. And I mean, you're talking about an entire nation that's already pretty much decentralized or, or uh, desensitized to the onboarding process and to digital assets, um, even outside of crypto, just in just the regular existence. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity there. Um, uh, and with the recent kind of fall down of like Terra Luna, um, you know, which really kind of ran uh, Korea and like, kind of held it out for the rest of the protocols. Now there's a huge opportunity for the protocols to kind of other protocols to enter that space and all these GameFi projects are trying to find places where, where they can land. Um, you know, where other areas too, where the jurisdictions legally are a lot more difficult to onboard, like the US is very, very, very difficult to onboard for GameFi, uh, where Korea is becoming more and more uh, open to that, not only from a legal jurisdiction standpoint, but all the other components of it. So, you know, I really would be looking to Asia as the first place we're gonna see like mass adoption. I think GameFi is again, something that's very tangible uh, you can abscond the blockchain layer relatively easily, I think, in gaming as well. So there's a lot of opportunity there. If you guys didn't have an opportunity to go to the games day here on, on uh, Friday, it was unbelievable. Um, super fun. And, super yeah. lit. It, like, 
Yeah, that's yeah. The, the energy, just amazing. It's yeah, like a, community. A billion users has to come from the retail side, mm -hmm. right? Like Republic Crypto is unique because we kind of sit the inflection point of retail and, and institutions. So we kind of touch both. Um, and if you want to onboard a billion users, it's going to be retail users, right? So where are those retail users going to be? Probably not on the investment side, right? <laughs> that's like not interesting to most people. Um, so it's going to be something on the entertainment side. So maybe that's ticketing um, or events. Gaming, you know, that's where it's going to sit. Yeah, or things like Chingari too, where you've got, like, if you want to talk about how community yeah. plays a role in onboarding. Definitely, I think. Uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes we often do is trying to differentiate between Web2 and Web3 users. So, so when it comes to new users, it's just to make it as easy for them as much as possible. And of course, that, uh, you have to understand that like onboarding is not has to be like Web3 native all the time, right? So you have to make them comfortable. Uh, infuse elements, especially engineering with product design as well. It's very much relevant, like how she's also been there. And I think uh, if you have to really club them in together, and I think they'll be able to give, up, give you the real value and answers to you as well. And so when you manage the community, they're able to give you the crucial insights. So uh, I think community gives us half the answers because as a firm, we, we can build three brilliant products in a year. But uh, we also want to involve the community involved in terms of giving us crucial insights how we can make it better for the users as well, right? What step in geographical demographics? Yeah, so I was going to say um, games are definitely where I, I would say see a ton of uh, potential for onboarding from the Web 2 industry to Web 3, right? And for a step in, we have a very... Um, global, uh, you, know, you know, diverse uh, user base in, in several countries of the world. We have huge, like, French communities. We have huge Korea um, communities in, you know, Australia, where we're founded, and also the U.S. And so I would say in terms of, uh, you know, gaming and kind of, it, it's important, I think, to consider what products or, um, companies that can engage you know web 2 users in a way that hasn't been done before with maybe a familiar experience or, or but it has a lot of crypto uh, behind the scenes and also teaches them a lot about onboarding um, and so a step in earlier this year we saw you know you introduce this game that kind of have these NFTs and is really different from your familiar experience of like a you know, 10,000 PFP NFT project, right? And I think the real potential will be with projects, uh, maybe you know, similar games like Stepin, where you can open up the door to, to thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of users with um, a way to engage them with NFTs that, like haven't been done before. So with the way we have our NFTs set up, you can actually mint more sneakers, and you know it, it's it's unlimited. So you can keep going and uh, continue sort of sharing this experience with more community members. Um, yeah. Without everyone having to sign an NDA, like where are the target markets for you guys coming into 2023? Yeah, so I know this is your panel, no, but said, I'm, I, said I, said I have my own question. I want you all to just talk because it was so much more fun when we're all just talking, like you know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so for 2023, we so we had some major partnerships we we're really excited about this year. So earlier we had our initial game offering on Binance with ASICs um, back in May, which was an incredible experience. Our first major Web2 partnership for Stepin, uh, which I think really touched on right. We have this, um, you know unique uh, game with, with NFTs that really hasn't been done before. But I think which was really key and, and crucial to forming this partnership is, you know, becoming uh, a, a partner with a Web2 brand that's familiar with a user base that we're really trying to target, right, in Web3 uh, fitness and lifestyle. So, you know, when, you, when we saw ASICs, people were basically going crazy, like they were looking for some more familiar brand to kind of uh, take, the, take the first step into Web3 with us. And, you know, then uh, recently we actually had another partnership to do a Cobra NFT with Atletico de Madrid. So now we're really getting in touch with some of like the major soccer fans who maybe were playing the game and um, some of the other users in Europe. And so actually one of the next um, 
major areas that I, I would love to target. I mean, I'm a little biased because I live in the US, uh, but I would love to see like a major, you know, um, partner with a major uh, marathon association, let's say, or some uh, sports association, sports, another sports wear brand, or... The New York Marathon was what, yesterday, right? Did you yeah, yeah, oh. so we actually, we, we, had a, um, we had an expo, we had a booth at the New York City Marathon, so we were starting to just like get in front over there and, and, and start to mingle with them, which was really awesome. Um, but, you know, hopefully we can look to kind of uh, really deliver the Web3 experience of doing like some fun co-branded NFT, let's say. Um, or, or something else even, maybe in-person community events. We've seen real success from like a community perspective uh, with all of our offline events where all of, you know, people from different countries and different cities in the world get together and, you know, go show everybody like their sneakers, like their step in sneakers, and they hang out and do like some run at the same time. Um, so we're really looking to do more of that as well. I think Trevor's really touching on a good point. The reality is that that type of onboarding is not going to come natively from a Web3 company, right? It's going to come in collaboration with large Web2 companies that already have mass distribution abilities. You know, the Instagram uh, announcement the other day, uh, you know, for digital collectibles, they're not calling them NFTs, I think they call them digital collectibles, is a good example of that, right? And I think that's kind of just the, the tip of the iceberg. So when you guys are building out, you know, your Web3 products, you know, I would be very cognizant of who the right Web2 partners are for you to help increase your distribution and, and access to that you know, potential three comma billion users. Oh, absolutely, when we saw the OK Bears and uh, Air Jordan do this, they did a high school um, basketball game. And it's just, it's an amazing way to see people like activated. It's a really exciting. I agree with that sort of web two, web three bridge for sure. Yeah, and, and also to, to uh, Sinlin's point earlier is there's going to be we're going to like need, there's going to be a demand, right? Like we're going to have to be ready to, uh, to prepare infrastructure for this, you know, familiar user experience. Like even with Stepin, um, you know, it, it's pretty easy to register and uh, for the app and things like this, but like, you know, it's the first time they're creating a wallet. Like they have so many questions that, you know, like what do I swap here? Like how do I do this? How do I do that? And I don't think we're like there yet where it's just like turnkey for somebody to just like dive right in. Um, but How yeah. far away are we? I, I don't <laughs> think we're there at all yet. I mean, we just started, uh, you, you know, we're just getting to like the tip of the iceberg, right? Like, you know, Stepin, I think has, uh, like I said, we reached some uh, million DAU, but that's like, you know, that's not gonna take us to a billion yet. And there are major, major challenges to even break into like the next 10X for, for our users as well, right? Both infrastructure, and creating, you know, maybe like a sustainable uh, game as well, right, for, for that growth, which is, is very tough, um, yeah. And I, I was gonna point out as well, like, I think it really is gonna be another familiar app or something that like takes the industry by storm. Like, we'll, we'll see it time and time again. I think social apps um, have really great potential, like maybe, you know, even like a WeChat, but of like Web3, right? Like something like this, um, especially in the future. Yeah, just to add on to that, I think the ideal onboarding process as well, right? So if you need to decide, like if you uh, the users need not go through the seed freezes aspect, I think you should totally do it. So that's where firms like Web3 Auth are very crucial in that phase. And of course, and as builders also, we need to take a step back and how do you make it for users to onboard, right? So not a lot of times we kind of always think about Web3 native users. And we don't really, the ideal way to Red Pill companies to actually take the route, like make it easier for onboarding. And even a couple of weeks back, Chase was tweeting the elephant in the room that we don't have users in crypto. Well, hello, that's because you're not a chinkari. So I think you have to use, uh, of course, the, the mid layer of middleware of apps, right? That's are going to be the very crucial to onboard new users. So I think we sh uh, often we should always take that experimental step back and see how can you make it u really useful for the users to onboard as well. And that's where the community also plays a big time in uh, bringing them and red pilling the entire community as well. Yeah, when we're talking about a billion users, you're talking about commercial viability, right? For sure. And we're just not there yet, right? Uh, and to make something commercially viable, especially from a data transfer technology, and that's what we're talking about, that's what this is, right? This is what blockchain is really, data transfer. It takes humans about 20 to 30 years. You had radio came out in 1889, it wasn't commercially viable until the 1920s. 
Television came out in the 1920s, wasn't commercially viable to the 1950s. Right? You had uh, uh, TCP IP came out in 1970, wasn't commercially viable till 1995 when it rolled out in Windows 95. Right? And it, 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 it's, this is not a technology issue, it's a human conditioning issue. Now there's something that's really unique that's happening right now, there's a direct parallel to, from the rollout of TCP IP and what we're seeing from blockchain. So in 1983, TCP IP became the standardization for internet building, mm. right? 13 years after it was originally invented. And here we are 13 years after Bitcoin's created and we're starting to see standardization take place, almost like a direct parallel to what we saw on TCP IP. So it's not crazy to think that we're still five, seven plus years out till true you know, till we see true commercial viability. We want it to be commercially viable. Everyone here wants to be the adoption layer, but we're not, we're the infrastructure layer, right? It's, it's the kids next, right? Every 13 year old on the planet has only existed in a world where Bitcoin's existed. In three years, every 16 year old will ex be, you know, only existed in a world where Bitcoin's existed. 16 is generally where you become a developer, you become interested in it. That's the adoption layer. That's who's gonna build a lot of the adoption products. And so the, the trick is like, can we ensure that they have all the tools necessary Right, in order to build, and right, and yes, yeah, that's what you're working on on the university programs. For is, sure. So it's your job to make sure that they have all the tools necessary. Got you. I got you. The next a lot one. of pressure, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and that will happen. I think it can be faster than that, that like 25 year mark, right? Things with you know, one thing that's really unique is listen, all coding is done in English, right? So there's a globalization factor. This is all open source, so people can all build together and collaborate together. These are things that can move that needle a little bit faster. But inevitably, it's a generational shift <clears throat> in order to kind of drive that adoption long term. Yeah, I, we were talking, I see this so clearly because, you know, when I started thinking about universities, I wanted to go in and be like, let's change curriculum. And it was really difficult. But then now I'm at the grassroots level working with the students at their student run blockchain clubs. And these are all kids who did not find the resources they wanted to learn, they are self-starters, self-educated, and they are like on fire, right? It's amazing. And they are definitely going to be building the coolest stuff that you're all gonna wanna be adopting. So I agree with that for sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we brought 160 student fellows to Breakpoint this year. Oh, man. Yeah, from all over the world. And they are crushing it. Yeah, we're very, like, very happy to have you all here. <laughs> So what would you guys say would be something that we could do in universities for um, bringing on those users? Selfish question for me, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I would actually say um, when I was at university, I didn't really see, I mean, they were just start, I mean, this, I mean, this was just like, you know, some, some five years ago, let's say, but th they were just, they hadn't really even started with like, you know, crypto events or uh, that many crypto courses or you know, curriculum, let's say, or even, um, you know, like clubs. You know, there were not that much. There, there, there wasn't many like community or like get togethers for crypto. So I would say that's like a great starting point. Just like get people together, meet face to face and just like engage in discussion uh, together, you know, to kind of uh, bring really like a face and like what people are doing in it. I think like ambassadors in the school are a great add-on to building the communities, just like Red Bull ambassadors at every university, they have a champion, they know who to follow, and that sets a good example. I think to me it'll be like a lot of DIY stuff, because until you're a power user, you're not gonna see the Red Bull movement, right? And maybe even a, one step further is like, lose your first life savings, a part of your life. I think that's the one way to also look at it, because when you, when you do it yourself and learn from it, that's, you have to consider like the first tuition fee. And then, then of course, there will be no stopping the students. I think you should keep in mind that it's not just engineers. Yeah. The common mistake that's made, as I was gonna bring this up back to stage, we ran out of time. You know, a lot of it's targeted towards engineers, like the validator programs that we talked about. And I'm a big fan of putting validators in universities and then using the rewards of those validators to help drive interest from the students and letting them experiment and, and play around uh, with the infrastructure side. But that's the engineering piece. Yeah. And, and that's great and that's important, but don't ignore like the business side. Don't, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, avoid the, the PR side, the ESG side. Like, it's, it's agnostic, right? Blockchain yeah. touches all industries, vertically agnostic, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, in, so like. You, Any I think future lawyer is gonna wanna know what smart contracts are, right? We if have, they don't. 
<laughs> we have 27 <laughs> securities attorneys at Republic. Right. So, uh, you know, we're, and we're not a law firm. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a really big place. And, and law firms are problematic for blockchain, mainly because law firms themselves are not motivated to push the envelope, right? They're risk adverse. They're man helping manage risk. Uh, Hester Pierce has talked a lot about this on the U.S. side, is that the, the law firms have held the industry back. Right? The reason that we have so many attorneys at Republic is because we believe that we can navigate the space better than outside counsel in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, so but I just mean like future lawyers, like young kids thinking about that, they're probably thinking about smart contracts, or they should be. So like, yeah, it touches every vertical. And I also think like to your point about like the engineering, it's like not to be so focused on it because well, the engineers are going to build the infrastructure and do a lot of wonderful things. They probably aren't necessarily the, the forward people that are going to bring out, uh, you know, the community and the social aspects that we're talking about in that design. So we need everybody and we need to activate everybody in those universities for sure. For sure. We're running out of time, but I do have like one. I just want to ask if anybody here, um, I want to leave like space to ask the audience for one question too. But before that, if anybody here has ever founded a company while drinking uh, Mexican car crashes. <laughs> Uh, well, we didn't found the company in that. Uh, I, I was CEO of a company called The Coin Tree. We were uh, the first multi-sig security storage company for Bitcoin back in 2011, 2012, 2013. What she's referencing is a story of uh, where we uh, were drinking Mexican car crashes, which is, I won't get into the details of the drink, but anyway. Margarita, uh, beer. Yeah, mar it, yeah, beer and margarita. But we became concerned about what happened to one of us if... Um, one of us died. Like, how did we get those assets to their families? And that was, it's a deeper story here, but that was the onerous of a lot of multi-sig development early on in, in blockchain, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Unless you guys have anything else to say, I wanted to add, like, leave it open if somebody did have a question in the audience, if that's cool with you. Does anybody out there have a question they would like to ask? Don't be. Is Stepin yes. coming back? Stepin is still building strong through the bear. Um, we just recently had uh, announced our ASICs uh, partnership this week. So if you actually pre-order the Solana-themed ASICs shoes, you can get the chance to win the first uh, ASICs-branded Solana-themed Stepin NFT um, on our blockchain. I guess that's good for us then. All right. A little early. Thank you guys so much. This was an absolute pleasure. Love speaking with all of you. Thanks, everybody.